before you ordained, I remember, before I ordained, I, in Bangkok, I was, uh, I was teaching English at the university there, and I was planning to go to India, and so I had a, I had an airplane ticket to India, and uh, then this question, should I ordain, or should I go to India first and see what I find there? And I always come back to Thailand or ordain any time. <laughs> or should I just ordain in Thailand and forget about India? <laughs> and, uh, you know, then other options, you know, going back to the States, see my parents. And first it remained kind of vague, kind of possibilities. And then as I was kind of realizing I had to make a decision, I got into a terrible state of anguish and I remember going going to my room and you know, I, I lay down on the bed and I, I can't I don't know what to do and I started kind of crying and and whinging and I lay there on the bed and I don't know what to do. <laughs> and then uh, in a voice something inside me said shut up and ordain <laughs> So I did. <laughs> I, just, uh, I just did it, you know. I didn't, and, and then, when, you know, when you think about it, then you, you know, you, it's the thinking process always take you to uncertainty. So, so I decided to just do it. You know, that's what the that's what it meant, and I did. And of course, I didn't. I had, you know, I thought two years would be enough. You know, Americans, we're so conceited that we think we can learn everything in two years. <laughs> I thought two years is enough. I'll just determine two years. <laughs> this is my 45th year. <laughs> so you very, you know, you could get hooked. <laughs> But the thing is, is uh, it's uh, commitment. You know, like the Samana life, like this is this is a alms mendicant order. So it, I find it because I live, I've been living in the UK for many years, and so and living as a bhikkhu there has, has not really been a problem. It's not you know like you have people are generous and then like our monasteries are well supported from both the Asian communities that live in England and, and as well as the, the British continental Europe. So you have, uh, you know, the requisites. Things are very abundant. But the, the, uh, but the thing is, sometimes it's too, too luxurious. We, we kind of expect too much. And uh, in our lives, we can take it for granted. Where actually, like, the samana is always reflecting on we have these called samana sanya reflections. So we have, uh, you know, this sense of, you know, I'm dependent on uh, the lay people for survival, you know, like food, shelter, robes, and medicine, and things like this. And I found these very helpful to cut through a kind of uh, middle class mindset of just assuming and taking for granted. Because it, it's very humbling when you realize what, what it is to put yourself right out on the edge of, you know, where even you can't have money and you, you can't uh, grow your own cabbages or <laughs> and you can't store food, you know, you can't have a, you know, save what's left from this meal for the next day. So, you know, you think, what did, the, what did the Buddha have in mind when he established this order? But the the magic of it is that it survived for 2,553 years, you know, on alms mendicancy. And of course it does, uh, you know, it, it, it does work. But, but the thing is, like, we can begin to just take, for, like in Thailand, uh, it's because it is a Buddhist country, you know, it's so easy to just take it for granted that people are going to feed you and things like this and 
That's where sometimes these two dong walks, you know, where you go wandering because you're, you're kind of, like here at Nana Cha, you can take a lot for granted that you're wandering around different parts of Thailand, you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Now, I, I, after my six pansa, six months, I went to India and went to Dong in India. And I wanted to test it out, you know, like uh, like the Buddha did, you know, to live like that. So I had, you know, arrived in Calcutta with, uh, I had a return flight from Bangkok to Calcutta. <laughs> And then arriving in Calcutta, this was 1972, I think. And, uh, and India, at that time, the, the Bangladesh had separated from, you know, Pakistan. So in Calcutta, there was all these refugees on the streets. And, and you know, I saw, you know, people dying right on the pavements and whole families uh, camped out on the, on the pavements and, in the train stations and things like this, and so I thought when I arrived, I thought, my God, what am I doing? You know, and they've got so many beggars here, and I'm, and I'm just another one. <laughs> in Calcutta, there, like there's a Mahabodhi Society uh, uh, from S Sri Lanka, and they, they were very welcoming and and helpful, but um, I lived, lived in India for about oh, over five months, in, just on alms food, and sometimes we we get, uh, you know, a lot of food, or in one place we were given banquets, you know, every day for about ten days, the Brahmin community in Kanpur give us banquets, vegetarian banquets. And then you'd go, and you maybe, I remember going and walking into a village one day and in the morning and there was a marketplace where they were selling tomatoes. And so they filled up my own bowl with that. <laughs> That's all I could, had to eat. <laughs> and so you never quite knew what, what, what you were going to get, but, uh, you know, it, it did uh, work still. You know, I, I came back to Thailand much thinner. <laughs> but the uh, the important thing is to is to uh, you know, like the the eight precept form is very good, and that's what's available here in Thailand. Is uh, that's enough? You know, it's a, but the point is to is to develop the path like liberation from ignorance. You know, we get caught up in forgetting that, and and uh, like in in uh, the West, it's so easy to attitudes of Western society are very different, and so you you have to deal with a lot of pressure to make everything equal and so forth, and and then you're part of a, an ancient tradition, and it could, and then you're obliged to to hold the you know be loyal to that tradition, so you can't really change it. And and then the, the problems, the misunderstandings that evolve from that. So it's like been a lot of criticism and blame going on. <laughs> but the point, uh, you know, is, is always to develop awareness around how, how things do affect you. So, you know, when when I get blamed or criticized, uh, you know, I found that uh, I used to be one who who didn't know how to take criticism, and um, so you know, people had to be you know be very careful and not offend me or say anything critical because either I'd blow it, you know, I had to lose my temper, or I'd be terribly hurt, and uh, so. <laughs> So, you know, and so as you get to know yourself more, you, you begin to see your weak point. You know, and here I was head of a community in, in England, and, and uh, you have to, you know, really develop. You can't be one who, who can't take criticism, because you're the focus of so much, so much attention. 
So I deliberately cultivated an interest in getting people to criticize me. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I began to really, you know, listen to others, you know, his, you know, encourage them to, you know, if they were angry with me or whatever, so that I could not try to, you know, because my tendency would try to to defend myself or put the blame on them or, or just dismiss it, but instead I just started listening, listening to them and seeing how it affected me when, when I'm under this critical criticism. And I wouldn't, I, I determined I wouldn't uh, defend myself or blame them because I did feel people had you know, whether they, their criticisms were, you know, maybe they just misunderstood or they, uh, you know, maybe they were justified criticism, or maybe they weren't, but I'd listen to them all the same. So then you're, you, you know, you're training yourself to be aware and you're keeping your attention, you know, here. So you, you're on the feeling level, so you're aware of uh, what, you know, people uh, say that uh, hurt your feelings, and I could be aware. You know, I, de I developed this awareness around, uh, you know, feeling hurt or offended or or indignant. Sometimes I get blamed for things unfairly, and and, and that makes me indignant. I get into this not true, and instead I just I just <laughs> not to speak on it, but just to. Uh, observe this powerful energy of righteous indignation, like being blamed for something I haven't done. And, uh, I, you know, it, it really was, uh, it gave me a lot of strength and confidence to, to deal with, uh, to be head of a monastic community, you know, in a good way, not just assume the position, but learn from it, as you you are, you know, you're, you're in a p very vulnerable position uh, where people see you and, and you know, like, I'm a, a big person, you know, so I'm an older man with a strong voice and, <laughs> and big body. So that can threaten people. You know, not that I'm going around, you know, bullying them or threatening them, but just, just the size and the, and the impression they have, you know, like Ajahn Sameda is like this and, you know, that I can't accommodate. I can't, you know, I can't change my size and age and all that. But, <laughs> but you realize how, how so many things like the way you, you walk or look at somebody can cause them some kind of emotional reaction that may be not be intended by me at all, but is part of their karma, you know, they're relating to, to fathers or teachers or authority figures and whatnot. Then the, the point is to really call attention, not, not to, you know, not to blame or justify, but to try to encourage them to observe the fear they have or the the threat, feeling of being threatened by me is like this. And after that I could, you know, I could deal with uh, praise and blame and success and failure and whatnot. I think, you know, we all dread being blamed. And in uh, living in the UK, you know, there's, there's a very blaming society. You know, uh, always uh, you know, anything goes wrong there, who's to blame, you know, so you're, you're trying to find somebody to blame everything for, and then I, and, and I could see this tendency in myself, you know, to, you know, like, uh, something goes wrong, and say, who's, okay, who's to blame? And, and they're almost the first reaction. <laughs> and I watch this, and I go, why do I do that? You know, why do, why do I always have to feel when something goes wrong, and the, you know, somebody didn't lock the door when they should have, or, or whatever. Yeah. Who's to blame? 
And so I started observing this, it's a habit tendency. Uh, and then you can do either, you know, look for somebody or you blame yourself. You kind of, you can feel guilty. If you accuse somebody of something they haven't done, then you feel guilty. Or maybe I'm to blame. Maybe I'm the one left the door unlocked. <laughs> this is where the mindfulness, you can really get, get a kind of perspective on on these, like their habits that one acquires. A lot of our characters are formed in the early years of our life. You know, it's not like you're consciously doing this or, uh, you know, you don't choose to do it. It's just uh, automatic reactions that, and attitudes and assumptions you pick up maybe from your parents or your family or your group. And that can follow you through your whole life. Uh, I can see tendencies, attitudes in myself now at this, you know, at this age that I acquired probably in early years before I could even, you know, before I went to school or anything. Probably picked it up from my, my mother and uh, father and and these, uh, you know, even though you can see them, they, it still tends to, you know, be part of one's karma. And now I know those tendencies very well, you know, so, you know, then if they're, you know, they, I, I know what they are, so they're not something that, that I believe in or follow, but still one can, can have, feel these certain kind of, uh, inclinations towards you know, thinking who's to blame, or uh, you know, whatever, whatever those might be. And so then you you begin to see that each each uh, human being, you know, we share the common humanity of the human species. We share consciousness, you know, and that and that's not, you know, that's not getting personal. But then each one of us has to deal with our own, you know, emotional tendencies or views, opinions, memories of the past and, and and so forth that are quite individual and personal. And so that's where, you know, we begin to see the common factors we share. Then living in, say, in a Wat Banana Chat, in a monetary, you know, that's why we have this form. You have an agreed way of living together the Vinaya practice, so that you you have a agreed structure to live within this this uh, act within these boundaries, and then the aim of it is not to institutionalize you or just browbeat you into conformity, but to you know it's a agreement on say moral positions and ethics and good manners and things like that. So you. You can be the observer of your own uh, emotional reactions, the individual reactions, what, uh, you know, in, and of course they're infinitely variable from one monk to the next, you know, they're not the same for all of us. And here, of course, you can see that it's very international community. <laughs> So you have to deal with, you know, so many, like in England, in Amaravati, it's very international. And, and then I was, I'm the oldest monk, and so you've got generation differences. So, you know, I find somebody of my generation finds it sometimes very difficult to understand the younger generation. <laughs> because my, what I, my expectations, my conditioning, from the 1930s and 40s is very different from what, what most of you have. <laughs> and, uh, and so, it is, you know, this is what I, how, how I tend to interpret experiences through my own, you know, attitudes acquired through the cultural conditioning uh, that was uh, available to me at that time. So, like I lived through as a child during the Second World War, and and uh, you had a whole different, like Americans had a different attitude, and there wasn't a superpower then, and it was, you know, 
it wasn't so wealthy and powerful and uh, and, and it, wasn't, it had much more restraint and, and it was more uh, kind of, uh, you know, wasn't so free to just do anything you wanted. But then in the 60s, everything kind of opened up into this, you know, kind of freedom to say or do anything you feel like, and drugs and whatnot. So in the 60s, I became a monk <laughs> during all the drug scene and free love and all that, I was incarcerated here in <laughs> not in what I thought, but at Wat Lapong in Lung Po Cha. Like the, the monastic form itself is, is helpful because it's, a, you know, you you're kind of committed to, you don't have the freedom to just do what you want, you more or less in even though one could leave at any time, it's not like, you know, it's a prison and you, a gun is held to your head and you have to stay, but uh, it's not so easy to leave, you know, where if you're a lay person, you know, you can, you can more or less uh, come and go and do what you want and because you have that kind of freedom and there's nothing, you know, there to kind of hold you for very long. I found like the monastic commitment very powerful because it kind of holds you through various phases of your own, uh, you know, where you, you know, you go through various periods of being inspired, being determined, having a lot of energy and, and uh, really loving the life and then it can go the other way, you feel disappointed, disillusioned with it all, but you have a way of learning from both the the positive and the negative. No, I found that you know, a lot of my, the strongest uh, the sense of strength and determination has always, in my life, has been through, oftentimes going through the darker periods, you know, where you, you, you know, you kind of, you know, everything's going wrong and, and uh, maybe your expectations or hopes people you know, friends turn against you or monks disrobe and, and you can feel these kind of emotions of disappointment or your teacher dies or whatnot. But the, the, the whole, the whole strength of the commitment holds you through oftentimes, uh, various, uh, vipaka kama that an individual has to experience. And then I found it oftentimes through the through the difficult patches is where I get the most uh, strength because uh, you know when everything's going well it's kind of you got you get energy and and that from being praised and and having good friends and everything blossoming and going in a way that you that support you but then it can go the other way it's like the Eight worldly dhammas, you know, the having high status or low status or uh, good fortune or bad misfortune, praise and blame, happiness and suffering. Uh, Ajahn Chah is always mentioning the, these eight worldly dhammas and emphasizing that, you know, one is positive, like praise is one and then blame is the, is its opposite. Of course, you know, being praised is pleasant and and then being blamed is is what we most dread or fear. So I don't to say they are of equal value. Or happiness, everything, you know, pleasant everything being pleasant and good and then everything falling apart. And so the the mindfulness practices are always being aware of these changing conditions. And in terms of these eight worldly dhammas then it and, uh, you know, I've always held that in my mind, like, of equal value. So when, when I'm being praised and honored and, and admired, then it's like this. And when I'm being criticized and blamed, then it's like this. So the awareness is the same, that the condition might be, uh, you know, praised and then or it might be blamed. 
you're observing conditioned phenomena rather than just trying to, you know, always be praised and be happy and and be inspired by life because this realm isn't, you know, it has it's a mixture of both praise and blame, happiness, suffering, good fortune, misfortune, having an important position or losing it, being, you know, being rejected by society or whatever. These things are uncertain and, uh, you know, we can't control the worldly conditions to do what we want, but we can observe them. And that's the, the, like the path, is being able to trust in this awareness, this mindfulness, sati, sampachanya, and then panya is our ability, like you discern this, you have this insight into, into this, and it, it's just a sense, simplicity of being aware, awake, and observing, rather than somebody who's trying to get something or get rid of something. <coughs> 